Hello, my name is Abby Heber, and I'm responding to this week's discussion post. When I initially read this assignment, it took me a few days to really hone in on a figure that I wanted to analyze and speak about throughout the post mellum economy. But I thought of turning towards the robber barons, given the number of sources that may be available to me. But I kept being drawn to this man who's not nearly as well known as those Gilded Age figures. And this man is Colonel Elliot White Springs. So a few years ago, when I was an archivist intern, the first collection the first collection I get was given to catalog consisted of a box. The box detailed the life of a postbellum entrepreneur, which led me down a bit of a curiosity driven rabbit hole pursuing the story of this man and his financial rise in the postbellum economy. Colonel Elliot White Springs bite sized biography is this. Born in 1896, Elliot White Springs would go on to fly in the United States Army. After his time serving in the Air Force, Springs would inherit the command of the Springs cotton mill from his father, Leroy Springs. Cotton production in the postbellum era was the leading cash crop, which acted as a backbone of the U.S. economy in the southern states. A 1907 work by economist August Kahn paints a vivid picture of how important cotton was to the American economy during a time when cotton had cemented itself as king crop. Kahn's work showcases not only how South Carolina was the leader in the development of cotton mill industry, but how Springs Cotton Mills, the, the company itself, were the pioneers of cotton production in the South. This success was in no small part due to Colonel Springs. Springs proved proficient in the management of the mill and was able to propel the popularity of the modest cotton mill forward by utilizing a strategy, and this is the interesting part, of scandalous advertisements. Colonel Springs would launch the Springs Cotton Mill into advertising fame and infamy through his ad campaign known as the Springs Mates Girl. The work, our 75th anniversary of the Springs Cotton Mills from 1888 to 1963, details the conception and birth of Springs Mates Girl's ad campaign. The ads outraged old maids, both male and female, rocked Madison Avenue. It was the product of necessity and genius. Necessity because a market had to be established for Springs made products, and genius because Colonel Springs chose to do it his way and quickly. The July 26, 1948 issue of Time published an article on Springs titled Textile Temptist. It read, Such lusty ballyho startled readers of the high neck New York Times. It grew stares from some readers of Time, Fortune, This Week, and Saturday Evening Post. However, the controversy seemed only to propel Springs Maid's name into further fame, catapulting the sales of the Springs Cotton Mills Company. A January 1950 article from Fortune magazine admits that Springs' risque techniques in advertising were responsible for sales increases of Spring Maid's products. By now, nearly every literate American is acquainted with the Springs Mills ads, but all of the cries have served only to impress the general public forcibly with the Springs Mills trademark, exactly the intent of Springs' campaign. Professor of Marketing James D. Taylor's deep dive on Springs concludes by summarizing the effects of Springs well. He states, Springs successfully practiced techniques of advertising to gain a national awareness for a brand of generic product that had been on the market for generations. Due to his strategic mind and cunning ad work, Colonel Springs led the Springs Cotton Mill to be the largest industrial employer in South Carolina by the time of his death in 1948. To give some economic context to this, the Midwest during this time period was going through its own economic boom and industrial boom, as detailed by David Meyer's article. In this work, Myers states that although the Midwest outpaced the South industrially during the 1860s and 70s, Midwestern and Eastern firms had expanded multi-regionally and nationally and had inhibited subsequent Southern industrialization, except in low-wage textile and resource processing. However, despite this boom in the Midwest, the corn of the South had on the textile market would be held and expanded in the 1890s and beyond. According to a cotton culture book titled The Making of a Southern Cotton Mill World, by 1900, two decades after the Southern capitalists ignited the mill boom, cotton manufacturing in the South reached a major landmark in its history, surpassing New England as the largest producer of coarse cotton fabrics in America. The Southern textile workforce grew from 16,700 in 1880 to nearly 100,000 in 1900. Although the opening sentence of Meyer's work, which reads, by the late 19th century, New England, Middle Atlantic, and the Midwest composed a manufacturing belt, is entirely true. The South would rise up in the 1890s and beyond to be the leader in textile production. Colonel Springs was there during the rise of this economic domination. Now, whether his methods 
of advertising were totally admirable is up for debate. However, there's no doubt that the success of Springs, who leaned into this lucrative textile economy, applied his own tactics of colorful advertising and supported the Springs cotton mill through the postbellum economy, was the one who helped truly lead the company into financial prosperity. No, he wasn't the tycoon of steel that Andrew Carnegie was, and he didn't have anything to do with railroads like the Vanderbilts, nor did he command oil like the Rockefellers, but he was a captain of industry for cotton. Thank you so much for listening. I look forward to reading and hearing all of your discussions. And a special thank you to the Winter Archives who allowed me to film in the archives and gave me many, many resources. So thank you to Winthrop's Archives for, for allowing me to do that.